All right. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Worthington, and I'm the director of the Office of Downtown Development with the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. And we are kicking off this year, 2023's webinar series with an incredible webinar uh, that we are hosting with Jason Ford, the Main Street Director with the City of Hartwell. Um, and it is focusing on volunteers. And I will say that we just concluded kind of the world tour of annual assessment stuff. And one of the things that has kept coming up time and time again is volunteers um, and kind of like how do you keep them how do you find them I mean all, all the things um, and I and we had this discussion when we were on the road but you know the volunteer kind of world is a little bit different now post COVID than it was pre COVID um, and a lot of our programs have found that they had, you know, a good solid volunteer base and then COVID kind of happened and at some point they've lost a bunch or people have moved on or they're, you know, doing different things or they've had to be more picky about the organizations and things they're supporting, um, a little bit more commitment shy. Um, and so I think, you know, today's presentation is just really timely. Um, I've always kind of been in awe of Hartwell and their volunteers um, and their volunteer program. Um, they've had, in my opinion, some of the most um, committed volunteer uh, groups <laughs> uh, and just like support of, you know, any program I've seen throughout our state. Um, and it's just been incredible to watch from the sidelines. But we've always talked about doing a webinar with them. So I'm excited that we're actually able to be here and bringing that to you today. Uh, so with that being said, Jason, um, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you share with us all the good things. All right. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone's hearing me okay out there. Uh, I appreciate so much uh, the opportunity to spend some time with you today. We do think our volunteers are incredible. Uh, we would get nothing done without them because we are a small community and it just takes many hands. So um, you know, we're we're excited to talk to you all about what we have going on. Um, so uh, I hope you can see there's a picture there of uh, our Monday night crew. So the first Monday of every month, we have a Main Street meeting and all of our volunteers come. So I, I think this picture has 25 or 26 folks in there and um, on one of the next slides, you'll see, but we have a, a lot, lots of folks who are active volunteers, um, but they also bring their spouses with them. So, uh, you know, depending on what we're doing, uh, we have a very dynamic uh, group and it, it seems to be growing. You know, our community is growing. And as people move in uh, to the community, I think our actual volunteers, the current volunteers, do the best job of recruiting new volunteers. Um, so just a little bit about Hartwell. So we're located, uh, we're the last exit on 85 going to South Carolina. Um, we've been a Main Street program since 97. We are housed in our downtown development authority. And like I said, we have uh, 48 active volunteers. And then I, you know, I put in there um, as, as some fun and their husbands, but it's very true. Um, depending on what we're doing, like I said, we, uh, depending on the task, we have lots of folks that can jump in. Um, and when I talk about uh, Hartwell, oh, we got a, a cute picture there. So Reed Oliver, uh, this is one of our, um, in a way, one of our volunteers. He is an awesome photographer. This is the start of Savannah River and the Hartwell Dam. Uh, just on the other side of it is Lake Hartwell. He has kind of been very gracious and said, you know, when we're promoting Hartwell, we can use his photography. And um, it, it's just a generous gift because he does uh, such a great job of capturing our community um, kind of community wide but also the downtown um, but uh, I like to say that Hartwell ha is, um, is second to none when it comes to volunteerism the, the entire community has an incredible spirit of volunteer so volunteerism as a community value uh, is important to us and, and we see these other uh, list of organizations in our communities that are service organizations and this is just a handful of them uh, you know as I was kind of thinking about this you know I, I kind of took a minute and started writing these folks down and that's something that I would challenge you to do is while we're talking about on the slide is is just write down 
other service organizations that might exist in your community. And, and then, you know, community development is about relationships. So, you know, reaching out to them and seeing where you can partner and seeing where you can overlap. Uh, in a way you're getting, yeah, you might be getting a project done, but you're also selling the Main Street vision uh, to the community. And you might overlap in one area in this instance, but you might also expand your volunteer base because one or two folks that that come out and help you with a community cleanup or a community planting or you know uh, organizing an event you know whatever it is um you know you might you might have two or three of those folks come in and say hey i want to i want to volunteer with your organization full time and so that might be something we talk about at the end you know what other organizations are out there that um, you know can support you in your efforts as a main street, but you can it's a two-way street. You know you also want to support them, uh, and that's where I think uh, our downtowns um, can really lead in our community. Uh, as we kind of go to this next slide, um, you know this is kind of the meat of what we're we're talking about: attracting volunteers to main street. Um, I think you have to have a value-based um, marketing plan for this. Uh, many of you may know who Simon Sinek is. He does TED Talks and he does like leadership talks. Um, and, and maybe a decade ago, he did this one talk on Start With Why, but he said, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Um, so it's great that you have a facade grant program. You know, it's great that you put flowers out. It's great that you have, you know, uh, creative financing to help businesses purchase and renovate buildings. But if you start with that, you're not going to retain the people that you need to retain. You've got to start with what you believe in because people want to link up with what you believe in. Um, so, you know, when we talk to the community, you know, we start with our beliefs and communicate that, that, you know, we love our downtown. Uh, many people who are volunteers grew up here when they remember Hartwell, what it was like when they were kids and they want their kids and their kids' kids to have that same experience. And so we, you know, we want to preserve this historic downtown for future generations. Uh, and if you start with that type of conversation, people are more apt to say, what can I do to help? Rather than saying, hey, we've got to go move all these rocks out of this area and throw them away or, or rearrange it so that the space is usable. You know, they might ask why, you know, and, and you may you may get some and you may not. Um, I do have a quick little video. Hopefully we transition over here to this. Hopefully you can hear this OK, but the link is embedded to uh, the slide. So, you know, I don't know if Jessica can, you know, draw our presentation is uploaded to the Dropbox. So maybe the entire presentation can, you know, get forwarded out to everybody. But uh, this is just a fun, silly little video, but I think it really demonstrates well what we're trying to do. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen. Start and let me know if this is working for everyone. And dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now, here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out. You brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If 
they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is um, how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over all five. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Okay, so I hope that uh, fun little video kind of demonstrates the the point, and, and I wrote that in the slides, you know, you have to have a core group and kind of at this end of this presentation, we have some testimonials from our volunteers, but um, one of our original Main Street volunteers described it that, you know, we had a, we had to get some, some new faces in and we used our friends network to bring it in, bring people in. And, and we gave, uh, we talked about and gave a, a new project over and it's one of the projects that we still do 10 or 15 years later. So it's that core group that can really, um, you know, get the fun started, you know, get your volunteers boosted up. And, and that could be one person, right? It could start with just simply one person. The other thing that we do is, you know, we make it social in nature, we make it fun and you make it meaningful. And we'll see a couple pictures and a quick video of some of our projects that we've done. But, uh, you know, we have, so on the first Monday of every month at four o'clock, we get all of our volunteers in a room and we conduct business. We go through the agenda of the things that we need to accomplish. We use the Main Street approach. We have four committees. Um, and then we kind of have a social event and, you know, people kind of hang out and we get to celebrate what's going on in each other's lives. And our city council meetings the first Monday night at, at six. And so if we need, um, you know, uh, people to come sit in chairs just so the city council can understand and see the support of a community, well, then everyone just kind of moves, you know, two blocks over and we go to the city council meeting together if we need to. And it's a really good way for uh, our volunteers to be engaged with what's happening across the community. It's really good way to have their voices heard, but it's a really great way to have a social network and fellowship amongst each other. We started, we, we tried, we did a bring a friend month, but that's really evolved into bring a friend anytime we're getting together. Um, and, and like I was saying earlier, um, you know, we've had lots of people moved to Hartwell lately. We've had lots of people who had lake homes, uh, after the pandemic or during the pandemic, they decided to stay and they wanted to get involved in their community. Uh, we also do lots of public recognition. So anytime we get a chance to talk to city council, to civic groups, we put things out in the newspaper, out on social media, you know, we're trying to constantly thank our volunteers for all the work they do. Um, and, but we also work on awards, right? We nominate uh, P4 Awards, there's a good one. Uh, this is a link, but I'm, I'm not gonna click on this particular link. You can Google Daily Points of Light Award. Um, this is a simple way. It's a really easy nomination process. Um, it takes about four to five weeks for the process to go through all of the way. But then uh, this organization will reach out to the nominee, get some feedback on them, 
and they get spotlighted on this website, this national website, um, you know, as a daily point of light award winner. And if you saw the quote at the beginning, that was started by President Bush the first. And, you know, he talks about, you know, how volunteers, you know, a thousand points of light. So um, I think everything that we do, making it public, uh, making sure that people know that this is a group of volunteers coming together to try to make their community great. Um, and then I think we're going to get into some of our pictures. Um, this area is uh, an area that was um, it's still really uh, underway. It's called Railroad Street Park. It's our old train depot. We used an Appalachian Regional Commission grant to save that depot. It was in disrepair. Um, very blighted. The whole area was overgrown. Uh, and really, we've had over the last year, year and a half, hundreds of volunteers come in and work to uh, put in this new retaining wall that you see on the left side of your screen. We filled that in and planted grass. We put in, um, you know, plantings in between railroad tracks. Uh, we've done a couple of murals on the back of the buildings. We're still working on cleaning up the back of the buildings in the lower right hand corner that's a, the historic way station um, pelican snowball came in and uh, they revitalized that building uh, we've been having our um, events back here in this space because this road can be shut down without impacting businesses um, and so it, this space is really transforming into really what you're wanting out of a pocket park uh, and it's all been thanks to volunteers. Uh, we'll see some pictures of that in a minute. I've got another picture of this. So at the train station, uh, we had two volunteers build this cute little playground. Uh, I think that's going to end up getting painted a little bit. Uh, but that this is this was worked on for a couple of months, and they finally assembled it just the other day. And I'm so, again so thankful to Reed Oliver for capturing these pictures pictures and putting them out. This is just a throwback. I mean, it recognizes the history um, associated with our train depot. Um, it makes it a fun area for kids and families to come out uh, and just enjoy time in our downtown. And uh, again, I just, I can't say enough about the folks who, you know, worked in this area to put this piece of our community together uh, because it did not look like this just two years ago. Um, here's just a, a, a couple of shots of different volunteers working on this. I mean, even that heavy machinery, you know, that was donated. That time was donated. They came in and they cleaned up some areas and they helped us install some picnic tables onto our uh, courthouse grounds. Uh, the bottom left screen, you see the uh, volunteers working in the very area that we were just looking at pictures of. Um, in the middle is Peggy Vickery. So she uh, is our Main Street hero this in this 2022 year, but she does so much for our community. And she's a, like a part-time program coordinator, but she does way more than part-time work. And she really is the driving force behind uh, keeping our volunteers, um, you know, engaged, bringing in new volunteers. Uh, we just couldn't do it without her. And then that bottom right-hand shot, you know, we see some some heavy lifting, you know, uh, swinging uh, sledgehammers there to open up an alley. That alley is called Constitution Alley. Um, we've got lights and picnic tables out there. It's actually technically a private alley, um, but the uh, it has to remain open for egress and ingress. And so the kind of the owners of that alley turned it into there's a brewery next door, and so they kind of turned it into you know this exciting little. Uh, almost a uh, you know like a pocket park again uh, area for people to sit and and hang out and fellowship and enjoy um, some ales in the alley. Uh, the next slide is going to be a time lapse video. Uh, it's fun because we get to see a mural go up, but you'll see and notice just dozens of volunteers coming out and checking on. These are University of Georgia students um, who put this up. We have uh, one of our volunteers operating the crane on the truck. Uh, we have people bringing them food. We have people helping with some of the base layer paints. So I'm going to start this. This is going to take about a minute to go through it.
So again, when we talk about make it fun and make it meaningful, um, this is a visual cue of something that um, people can see right away um, as you know a project completed. Uh, they can see the work that they did, what went into making this project complete, and, and it's down in that same area of the, the Railroad Street Park that we just looked at. Um, the view is of the Trussell Bridge that crosses Lake Hartwell and kind of comes into town. We want to wanted to capture the historic train that comes in. And you can see on the left-hand side there kind of the, um, the ticket office for all trains, the little conductor in the window, um, his name's Bill Leard, but he ran that bucket truck for two days and kind of as an afterthought, they wanted to tell him thanks for spending so much time out there that they painted him into the mural. So uh, it was, a, I think it was a very sweet gesture. Um, but then we get into retaining volunteers. You know, how do we, how do we keep it going? Um, so we talked about celebrating wins, but we also celebrate wins inside and outside of the program. You know, people come in and they talk about, um, you know, their grandkids and they talk about, you know, oh, what, you know, I, sorry, I couldn't make it. I mean, they're so apologetic because, you know, they had something going on with their families. They wanted to be at a meeting. They hate that they missed it. But we just take time to celebrate birthdays and accomplishments. And then, of course, we celebrate the effort that each of our volunteers put in. Um, when, when I was talking to Peggy Vickery about this, our part-time coordinator, she gave some of these things. She talked about communication, communication, communication really getting the word out about you know not only the project that we're doing but how it fits into the scheme of what we're trying to accomplish um, you want to engage their ideas listen there's lots of experience out there people have lived full lives and um, they have things that they bring to the table and so you know relying on their expertise is very important um, and or we, you know, we give our Main Street group volunteers, of course, we have a steering committee. Um, so we have a group of folks and we say give ownership, give a budget. Um, so we have um, some pools of money for each, you know, for promotion, for economic vitality, for design that they can spend. You know, they can kind of internally discuss and prioritize what do we want to spend these funds on. Uh, we have those same folks, that same steering committee that come back and say, you know, okay, we want to spend some money on this or we need to get some supplies for, you know, some other project or maybe we're doing something big. You know, right now we're working on wayfinding signs and we're working with uh, the city council to, to pay that out of the city's budget rather than out of the main street budget. And so those volunteers not only do the projects that we need them to do, they're a voice to our elected officials to help them understand why this is important and what it's going to do for the community. Um, you know, we'll talk about some challenges in a minute, but so our volunteers are kind of accountable through our other volunteers. They, you know, if you sign up to come work an event at eight o'clock and, and you're late, that thing might not get set up right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can trust on our volunteers to, they work with each other to like say, hey, I'm not going to make it. Can you cover my part or can we, sh can we switch? Um, and then this was kind of important, keep meeting short. When I first came on as a Main Street manager, we had a design committee on the second Tuesday of every month and a economic vitality on a different day. And, you know, it's, a, it's still a small town. We still have a limited number of people. We can't borrow from another community when we're 40 minutes from everything. So we kind of have to be homegrown. And it was just, it became easier for us to consolidate those meetings into one meeting. Um, we got better over time at sticking to an agenda and, and not running long. Uh, we got better at having subcommittee meetings so that ideas can get flushed out and then brought to the group. And um, it's really just been awesome to be a part of. You know, I, I don't get to take any credit for our volunteer group because I mean, a lot of them were here before I was here They've continued to work and grow through the programs. And really, I've got to thank them for my success, if I have any, because, you know, they're doing a lot of work uh, and they uh, create a meaningful work environment for me. And so uh, our volunteers 
um, really deserve all of the credit for the exciting things that have been happening in Hartwell lately. Um, this is something for us to maybe talk about here at the end. We're actually getting to the end of the slide pretty early, but um, you know, what are some of the challenges associated with, you know, uh, with volunteers? You know, the reality is, is they could be doing something else. Um, they could be spending time with their family. They could be going on that vacation. A lot of our volunteers are retired, but not all of them. Some are, some of them are maybe nearing retirement, but, and we have some young folks that are starting to come in and get involved. We work on, getting the school involved, but they have schedules and things that they want to be doing. So, you know, going back to the beginning of that value-based statement of people want to be involved in an uh, organization who believes what they're doing is important and, and trying to align those beliefs. You know, one of the questions that we might talk about is how do you hold a volunteer accountable? What if something goes on, goes on out in the community that didn't necessarily work out the way as we intended it to go. Um, how do you match talents and passions with projects? Um, you know, how do you coordinate schedules? Um, and, you know, I pose this as a question to the group. You know, what are some of the other challenges out there that you've experienced? And, you know, that's something that we can talk about as groups, not just here today, but maybe at Main Street meetups, um, you know, there's a whole network of um, folks who are experienced and have, you know, years under their belts of going through the ebbs and flows of, um, you know, success in their programs and success in having volunteers. And so I, I would just, you know, you know, be on the phone and, and send emails and ask, hey, what's going well? What are y'all doing? And um, just a couple of things, you know, from our volunteers, I'm going to leave this slide up just a little bit so you can read those, but these are just kind of testimonials. This is like, I asked, why are y'all here? You know, uh, really it was just the, uh, the other day we had our kind of our uh, DDA Main Street meeting and I had just found out that we were going to do this. And so I, I said, well, why, why are you here? You know, what can we share? And so you can take some time and read those. But the first one I, I want to I want to share with you, it was the one that I was talking about at the beginning. It was early on when Main Street was struggling for new volunteers. We made an all out effort to bring together some new folks in town, along with some other uh, possible volunteers. After orienting these new faces to what Main Street's goals were, we gave the new group a project, which was a Scarecrow Bash and Monster Mash event. We hold that event every year. Um, but the rest was history, and this group launched one of our most successful and sustaining events. And then she said, of course, you know, have wine. So yeah, th I guess that's a very useful technique. Is that, but again, but that's that social component. Uh, Nancy Hardigree has been with us since the beginning. She's been a trusted confidant to me since I was new. Anytime I have a question of what's going on, what could we be doing, um, I can call Nancy and say, hey, what's up? And then she's also one of the first people to buy in. Right. Like if I have a new idea uh, or if we're, um, you know, doing something that's a little bit challenging, I can call Nancy and say, hey, Nancy, I need some help with this. And I can count on her without question to um, kind of help rally the group. So, um, you know, these are all uh, great examples of, like I said, testimonials of why people are involved. They believe what we believe that downtown's important. So with that, that really kind of is the run of show. I mean, I, I would take questions and hope we can go backwards and talk about any of these that, that you may want to talk about. Thank you, Jason. Um, so guys, throw some questions in there or I'll just start asking Jason questions. <laughs> Let's see. I really like, Jason, how you hit on communication, you know, um, not only communicating with the volunteers, but also the value of communicating, like, the impact of what they're doing and why you're doing it. Um, because I think we don't always 
take enough time to do that. Sometimes it's just, we got to get stuff done, right? And somebody help me. <laughs> um, one person asked, how did you get the UGA students to do the mural? Okay, so great question. So a couple of things. We are what's called an archway program. There's an archway partnership. This is through University of Georgia's public service and outreach um, because they're the land grant, land sea grant uh, institution for the state of Georgia. So it's a program that you can apply to to be to become of. And as a matter of fact, uh, they do a, a new program called Connected Resilient Community. But um, we asked through that program, we can ask for resources from the University of Georgia. Can um, are there any professors or students that can support these projects? We discovered that yes, they have this awesome mural program called Color the World Bright. You don't have to be an archway community to contract with them. They've basically created uh, 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 a learning laboratory for students so that they can uh, do murals and learn that you can do art as a business. And so uh, you can reach out either through UGA's webpage, but I think they have some social media. It's called Color of the World Brights. They do murals all across the state. We've done six or seven murals with them, and they are phenomenal. Uh, and they are, the really nice part is that they're about the third of a price, of whatever the price of a mural is, they, they come in about a third of that. So I think the most, that train mural that we did that y'all saw is, I think the most expensive one we did, and that was only about $7,000. And then we work with business, businesses, building owners pay for those. The, the city doesn't uh, put any funding into that. Um, but we did one and then it kind of became dominoes. Other people saw and said, hey, how can I get a mural? Um, it's really breathed life into our community and, and public art is a, and art in general is just a big deal here in Hartwell. So, um, you know, there's a couple of things that go along with that program. You got to feed them, you got to house them. Um, but then, and so we have folks that come out and check on them all day long. Uh, they put that up in two days. So they're just really masterful at their, their craft. That is incredible. Two days. Wow. Um, and I would say too, uh, just, you know, I think working with UGA just highlights again, the idea of like what resources are around you, right. As a community and not just looking like in your, your own community, but also the region, right? Like, is there a university you could tap into? Is there a really strong artist guild you could tap into if you want to do something like that? Even, you know, um, reaching out to the high school or something. Uh, next question. This is a good one. How does your steering committee uh, coordinate with your board? Yep. So we do uh, a couple of things. Our our DDA board is uh, we meet uh, Wednesday, the third Wednesday of every month at noon. Well, that steering committee meets at 10:30 uh, the same day, and so then they stay after to you know attend the DDA meeting. And during that meeting, we carve out time for a Main Street report. And so, um, and even if they can't all stay, um, our Main Street coordinator, Peggy Vickery, she kind of becomes that liaison uh, between kind of the DDA, the board, and then the steering committee. And our steering committee is made up of the four committee chairs, Peggy and myself. And so there's some accountability from, from actual staff, uh, but then there's also input from the different committees. And we do kind of a co-chair um, committee group. So because people do go on vacations, people do have things going on. So we have, um, in each committee, we basically have eight folks that um, kind of work together to steer those committees. And um, again, it kind of comes through communication. Um, there are go-to when we have something going on that we need to present. We say, and that's a two two way communication, right? We rely on that uh, steering committee to push information out uh, to the group at large, and then also to relay, um, you know, needs, wants, concerns, those types of things to the board. Jason, do you find that you have less resistance for people heading a committee since it's 
something they're co-chairing? Oh, for sure. We, we've had many instances when people have said, okay, I've done my time. I, 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 uh, I, need, I need a break. Um, I'm happy to help, but I don't want to chair anymore. Mm -hmm. And what has resulted in that is we say, okay, well, who's, who's taking charge of this, right? We, we, we don't leave a whole lot of space to say, all right, well, we're not going to do this anymore. We, we've got to have someone in space. And usually uh, a couple of folks will say, hey, well, if we do it together, we can tackle that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's something that's so simple, but not something we always think about kind of implementing. We always think, oh, you have to have one leader or one person. But I like the idea of this co-chair, you know, whether it's a committee or a task or a project, again, just takes a little bit of that pressure off and also I think kind of lowers the wall for resistance of people wanting to participate but not wanting to be, you know, the only one calling the shots. Yeah, you know, just I, I mean in general, I think it's good to have redundancy because someone might just be out of town True. and we still have to, you know, kind of get through the, the task ahead of us. And Absolutely. so there, there's multiple reasons why I think it kind of works. Um, of mm -hmm. course, you got to have a large enough group for that to work, but that comes. True. Um, I think you already answered this, but I'll, I'll ask it again just to make sure. The agenda for the, the first Monday meetings, are they organized by point or by strategy? So it's really organized by, um, so if you take that four point approach, mm -hmm. um, we kind of call the meeting to order. I give some updates about, you know, maybe what's going on at city hall or, you know, upcoming on city council meeting. Um, uh, Peggy, our, our coordinator, she'll come in and kind of give some updates about, you know, 30,000 foot view of Main Street. And then we run through each committee and what they're working on. So we'll have design committee, you know, this time of year, they're working on flowers and getting plants together and, and partnering with businesses to make sure that those things are going to get watered and taken care of. So they'll run through the program list of things they're working on before they move on to the next group. And then, and of course, embedded in that is new ideas, potential new projects. Um, and so that, that takes 15 or 20 minutes. The hour generally lasts an hour. It doesn't, it might go over a little bit, but not much. Um, that is something we had to work on. I mean, we sometimes had meetings at the beginning where, I mean, it just wouldn't end. Um, but, you know, with anything, the more you do it, the more time you spend on it, you're able to kind of, you know, parse out the important things that we need to communicate as a group. And mm -hmm. then what can we do via email, small group, um, you know, small, just smaller subcommittee strategies. Hmm. Um, do you have any tools that you, or technology that you use um, that you think are helpful with coordinating volunteers and kind of your efforts? So right now we just use email. I know there are lots of, there, there's different um, platforms out there, different uh, apps that you can use, but uh, you know, we have, uh, a lot of our folks are, you know, they're in the aging population. Technology isn't the best, you know, more technology ways isn't the best. Email works well for us. And so I think that now we do get a lot of reply alls, right? So you have to kind of parse <laughs> through the reply all button, but that's where it works for them. And I would say rather than create some task that makes it easy for you, making it easy for the volunteer to participate is more important. And so that's what we do. And I think you hit on something really important, like understanding the age of your volunteer, right? Um, and hitting on that because of, you know, your volunteer base, you know, you're meeting them where they are. That's, you know, the best way is through email. All right, next question. Um, is there any formal volunteer training or orientation um, you uh, do or require for new volunteers? So I would say the answer to that is yes and no. So okay. we have all of the manuals. We have all of the um, training that is um, provided really from Georgia Main Street. Uh, we have the Main Street 101s. 
we do things like this, we take this and turn around, but it's a little bit more on the job training. So it's not rather than, hey, you're new here, do these things and then you can participate. You kind of get it along the way. And I think that that's important because it can be overwhelming to someone who is new to, to send them away with a bunch of manuals and say, hey, read this um, you know, 17 or 18 page document. Um, we have lots, you know, again, again it, it, it might be different based on where you are um, in, in the, uh, you know, in the spectrum, but we have lots of experience in our group and we're able to communicate, you know, what Main Street is, the Main Street values, what, what our strategic plan says over the course of time, rather than as an upfront delivery. Awesome. Um, so, um, one of the questions was how many members do you have? And I think I remember you saying you have around 48 like volunteers, like core. That's right. Yeah. Uh, kind of historically, it was around 20 or 25. Mm -hmm. And over the last year or two, it's grown a lot. Do you ever have to limit or turn down people or any problems with like too many cooks in the kitchen? Yeah, not too much. I mean, sometimes we have some of that and, and that's where Peggy really is. Uh, she does some real magic of like kind of giving people something to do, you know, a task so that they can be a part of it. And um, because we're blessed with so many people, um, once they see that, hey, enough people are, are working on that project, I can go do something somewhere else. Um, you know, that's a that's a great thing for us. I would say, you know, I don't know that we should really ever be in the business of turning a volunteer away. Um, there are certainly times where I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, what are we doing? But, um, you know, anytime someone wants to help you out, I think that's generally better than the opposite. So I think that for me, uh, you know, bringing the volunteers in and working with them so they kind of understand the process, uh, understand we're doing things the way we're doing it, why we're doing things the way we're doing it. I think people get it. Awesome. Um, so what advice would you give to either a new manager or a manager that's kind of struggling to build their volunteer base, like where where should they start? What were, what would be some like first steps that you recommend for them? Some kind of low hanging fruit to start like building their volunteer base. Yeah, so I think it starts with relationship development, right? So we talk a lot about the importance of getting out of the office and going and walking the streets, going and walking downtown, making friends. You know, just you know beyond that. Um, you know, professional relationship that we have with our business owners, you know, you get to, to the point where you're getting friendly with folks. Again, these are small towns. People generally know each other anyway. Um, and so you're relying on that relationship. Um, and over time, you can just ask, right? Hey, I need help moving four big pots over here. Can you help me move these pots over here so we can plant them and put them back? that's where it begins with these very small tasks and once you get a few things done everyone likes winning right so you celebrate the win of a completed project and then that kind of triggers other people to say well, what was that how can i be involved do you need me to do anything i've got a truck can i help you move anything so really i, th I think it all kind of boils down to relationships and maybe it's the mayor maybe it's a a, a, a a commissioner or a councilman that you know kind of has the ear of a lot of folks um, but that list of civic partners at the beginning i think is the most important these are people who are already volunteering somewhere so if you can go talk to your rotary or your Qantas club you know garden club whoever it is if you're able to go there and, and just say hey how can i help you can we work together on this thing over here on the square you know whatever it is um they're already service oriented. And so tapping into those is the best thing. Absolutely. All right. 
don't think we have any more questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate your time. This was great information, very inspiring, and uh, we will get this posted um, for anybody who wants to share this with their volunteers or with uh, other staff or board members for later viewing. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it.